Hello friends, my name is JJ, and as you can see, I am on a train right now, heading to Ottawa. Mask mandate still in effect. So I had to go to Toronto to attend a friend's wedding, and then I did a wacky meetup alongside fellow YouTube superstar JREG. And then I got a phone call asking if I could make it to Ottawa, the nation's capital, for another day of testimony at Parliament in the ongoing hearings on Bill C-11. So that's where we're headed now. So for those of you who have not been watching my channel over the last few years, Bill C-11, formerly Bill C-10, is a legislative initiative from the Justin Trudeau administration that seeks to make Canadians' internet experience more nationalistic. Which is to say, Bill C-11 aims to give the Canadian government the power to control the sort of content that sites like YouTube show to their Canadian users. The idea is that Canadians are currently watching too much foreign content, which is bad, when what they should be watching is more good Canadian content, which would help improve the patriotic health of the nation. Of course, in order to get YouTube to promote more good Canadian content, the government would have to come up with some sort of definition of what good Canadian content is, which would in turn incentivize or even all but require Canadians to make this type of content if they wanted their stuff to continue to get traction on the site. And therein lies the controversy. Is it really appropriate for government to be trying to steer what Canadians are making and watching in this way? Obviously, I am simplifying things a fair bit, but only because I have written and spoken so much about this bill by now. If you want more information, I suggest watching one of my many other award-winning videos on this topic. But thankfully, for those of you who are getting sick of hearing me yammer endlessly about this topic, we are getting near the end of the saga, because Bill C-11 is now currently before the Canadian Senate. So you see, in Canada, before a bill becomes a law, it has to be approved by both chambers of the Canadian Parliament. And back in June, C-11 passed the first chamber, the House of Commons. I was involved in that debate, and I made a whole other video about it. But now, as I film this, the bill has moved on to the Canadian Senate, which is basically the final step in the process. And what is the Canadian Senate, you ask? Well, the Senate of Canada is actually quite weird. Bad, some might say. While the House of Commons is a chamber of elected representatives chosen by the Canadian public to represent 338 different geographic districts of roughly equal population, the Senate is a 105 member body appointed by the Canadian Prime Ministers to represent nothing in particular. The different provinces of Canada are given arbitrary numbers of senators based on no consistent geographic, historic, or numeric logic, most famously embodied by the fact that Alberta, a province of four and a half million people, is represented by just six senators, while New Brunswick, which has less than a million people, gets 10. Senators used to hold office for life, but now they just serve until age 75, at which point the Prime Minister gets to pick their replacement. Currently, just over half of the Senators were appointed by Prime Minister Trudeau, with about a quarter appointed by former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, and the remaining quarter by all of the others. Now, the way that this whole cockamamie situation is justified these days is with the argument that regardless of how the Senators are picked, they are still a useful part of the Canadian political process because, in some way, they are like smarter than other politicians. The Canadian government even made a fairly infamous propaganda book called The Wise Owls pushing this thesis. In order to ensure this higher caliber of politicians, there has been a lot of interest among prime ministers in recent decades in appointing people from non-traditional political backgrounds. So people like doctors and lawyers and professors and business people and even some low-level celebrities. Prime Minister Trudeau has also made a big show of appointing non-partisan senators who have no allegiances to any Canadian political parties either. This is all being done to uphold the Senate's supposed mission as the House of Review, a chamber of people who are maybe capable of thinking about legislation in a more calm and rational way, as contrasted with the reckless partisanship of the elected House of Commons. Anyway, before the full Senate gives any bill an up or down vote, the Senate has one of its many committees investigate the bill in more detail. A committee is a smaller group of senators who study the 
text of a bill very closely and might even come up with some arguments. And part of the committee process involves summoning witnesses who might have some unique insight into the subject of the bill. Witnesses like me. So let's get going. J.J. McCullough had faced many obstacles in his life. This is my greatest challenge yet. Senate testimony. J.J., you say that um, last time they yes. weren't even listening to you. They weren't even listening to Except me. Except for the conservative ones who, I guess, <laughs> yeah, I guess wanted to save face and look at you. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, these things are a bit, of, a bit of theater. You know, they matter a lot to the people doing the the testimony, but when you think about it, you know, most of these politicians, they do nothing but attend committee meetings all day, every day, just an endless stream of witnesses testifying about this, that, or the other thing. It's a big moment of fame for just, you know, some random witness to go to the parliament and sit in the chair and be on camera, but the politicians don't care, and I think their behavior reflects that, but, you know, as many people have said to me, they also chose that line of work, so the least they could do is at least feign interest. This is going to be a slightly better turnout. This is going to be a more balanced and fair meeting. Because instead of just having one YouTube guy who's against it, they're going to have two YouTube guys that are against it. Yes, as is my understanding. Another, another YouTuber. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more, a little bit more fair and balanced. And I've heard from people who say that the, at least a few of the senators on the committee are a bit more, a bit more open-minded, a little bit more, a little bit more curious. Because in theory. That is what the Senate of Canada is supposed to do. It is supposed to provide the so-called sober second thought to the rash decisions of the House of Commons. They act as the, as the cooling saucer cooling for the hot, saucer. the hot emotions. Oh yeah, okay, you keep saying in theory, JJ, does it work? Uh, no, not usually. <laughs> <laughs> because the thing is, is that even if the Senate proposes amendments, they still ultimately have to be ratified by the, by the elected chamber. And if the Senate and the Senate does this from time to time. If they propose a bunch of, of amendments to make the bill more moderate or more, you know, uh, reasonable, the House is under no obligation to accept those amendments. They can just say, thanks, but no thanks, Senators. We'll take it from here. And also one of your well-known wacky political takes is abolish the Senate, right? Yeah. So you, yeah. Why, don't, why, don't, why don't you open with that? Dear Senators, I want to fire all of you. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of Senators themselves who are pretty skeptical of the Senate as an institution. It is so manifestly bad in so many ways that I think it's kind of hard to, hard to escape the obvious conclusion. But, but, the, but at the same time, like that does, that sort of insecurity about the institution itself can lend itself, in theory, to kind of more productive, engaged lawmaking because they're aware of the limitations of their public credibility and their public legitimacy. So they only try to intervene, in theory, in the interests of, you know, fundamental Canadian rights and only when there's like a real sort of dangerous threat to Canadian liberties or democracies or stuff would they, would they dare to step in. And I think one could make a case that some of those issues are raised by Bill C-11. How you feeling, JJ? How you feeling? I'm feeling just fine. JJ in Ottawa, Ontario. Who knows what he'll say or where he'll go? Is he gonna complain about bureaucratic rot? Or will he just talk and talk a lot? JJ in Ottawa. You're, you're gonna you're gonna go in. You're gonna simmer tensions. You're gonna you're gonna offer compromise. Yes. Everything I hate to hear, but yes, you're doing it all for a cynical political purpose, which is to achieve your own ends, and that's why I support it. Uh huh. So, no, I'm doing this for the betterment of all Canadians, trying to fight for online freedoms, the right to choose what we make, what we view, what we get exposed to, what we don't get exposed to. Decisions that should be made by you and me, not by big government. You can tax big tech. You can even pass the costs on, pass the costs along to us, the consumers and the creators. Just don't screw with the algorithm. Don't force us to make certain kinds of content. Don't create perverse incentive structures to value certain types of Canadian content over others. Just leave creators and audiences alone. If that has a price, there's a price to freedom. I think we'll have to pay it. 
financially, but the price shouldn't be born in terms of freedom itself. Why can't these mean old governments just leave the poor tech companies alone? Well, I'm saying the opposite of that. It's fine if they... Why do they have to increase tax? <laughs> but yes, it's fine if they have to increase tax. And in fact, maybe they should even extend the privileges that new media gets to old media, like CTV. Yes, spoken like a man who has read <laughs> my opening statement before I delivered it. Yes, indeed. All right, well, there's the Senate. JJ walking, JJ walking. Colleagues, nous prenons maintenant notre étude. We are resuming our study of C11 for our second panel. Uh, independent filmmaker JJ McCullough, YouTuber and columnist, and Weight Sharp host the Weight Sharp Show. Welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, each panelist will have a brief five minutes for uh, an introduction and um, statement, and then after that we will be going to Q&A with my Senate colleagues. And now we'll go to Mr. McCullough. Hello, Senate friends. My name is JJ McCullough, and I am a professional YouTuber. I run a channel with around 840,000 subscribers, which might sound like a lot, but as I told the House Committee when I testified a few months ago, I have barely cracked the top 400 uh, top YouTubers in, uh, in Canada. Now, the reason why I'm here today is because over the last few months, I have had the honor of helping lead the charge on behalf of a large and thriving Canadian YouTuber community in our fight against Bill C-11. Shortly after I spoke at the House, video of my testimony went viral and was viewed over half a million times, which I think we can all agree is no small feat for a Canadian parliamentary committee hearing, and a testament to the depth of public interest on this issue. Thanks to that video and several other videos I've made about Bill C-11, I am now often stopped on the street by strangers who are worried about this legislation. When I'm walking down the sidewalk, I have even had people pull up in their, in their cars beside me and yell out, hey, aren't you the Bill C-11 guy? Is it really as bad as they say? And going forward, my answer will very much depend on what this committee chooses to do. Now, I want to be very clear about something. Content creators and consumers don't merely consider Bill C-11 a badly written bill, though it certainly is, and I think Justin has made it clear why. Many people, however, consider the bill at its core badly motivated. Of the dozens of online video makers and viewers I have heard from, all have been crystal clear that they have zero desire to live under a government with the power to force platforms like YouTube to push, promote, suggest, or otherwise encourage certain kinds of Canadian content to Canadians who have not freely chosen to see it. Arguments that doing so will somehow improve Canadian patriotism or nationalism or cultural sovereignty, in the words of the minister, are unpersuasive. The freedom of Canadian video creators to make what they want and succeed or fail based solely on the degree their content is enjoyed by an audience, domestic or foreign, is seen as a well-functioning status quo few Canadians want overturned. In its current unregulated state, YouTube has produced extraordinary Canadian success stories and given Canadian viewers untold hours of enriching content. To view this as a problem that needs fixing reeks of political obliviousness. All that said, I know how the Canadian government works, and I am sensitive to the unique constitutional role of the Senate. I know that at this point in the lawmaking process, people like me should hope for compromise rather than perfect victory. It is similarly important to concede that proponents of this bill within the Canadian media industry are animated by a sincere desire for fairness. The Canadian YouTubers and their audience members that I've spoken to are certainly broadly sympathetic to the idea that large tech companies should pay the same taxes and fees as any other media firm doing business in this country. YouTube has in turn suggested that if higher costs are imposed on them, these costs could be passed along to Canadian creators and users in the form of more ads or higher fees or even lower revenues for creators like us. But I think that this is a price that many Canadians would literally be willing to pay. Given the choice, I think most creators and their audiences would make a modest financial sacrifice if it meant that government would in turn no longer seek the power to influence the types of videos 
it believes Canadians should be watching or making. Another reasonable compromise that would uphold desires for fairness would be to simply lessen existing Canadian content broadcast obligations on old media rather than spread the burden to new media. Legacy broadcasters, after all, are not wrong to believe that internet broadcasters have received historically special treatment. During the 1990s, the Chrétien government made the far-sighted decision to explicitly not grant the CRTC power over online content, believing an unregulated internet would be the best way to let Canadian creators thrive. That prediction has more than come true, as evidenced by the enormous number of Canadians like me and my friends here, who now make a living producing user-generated content for online audiences the world over. My hope is that the Senate does what it can to ensure this proven recipe for success is preserved. And if it's envied, why not afford all media its same privileges? It is freedom of choice and expression, after all, that have always been the greatest, that have always been the greatest enablers of Canadian culture not the heavy hand of government dictating what Canadians could or what Canadians should be creating or viewing. That is the tradition of some countries, but not of ours. In Canada, freedom should never be viewed as an obstacle to patriotism. Thank you. After my opening statement and the opening statements of the other two witnesses, the YouTuber Justin Tomchuk, who runs the animation channel Umami, and is possibly an even harsher critic of Bill C-11 than me, it opens up Canada Canada to liability by potentially violating the USMCA and we could expect retaliatory actions from the United States and the EU. It also sets a precedent for other countries to impose similar laws, compounding the problem, creating nationalistic bubbles of content rather than a free exchange of culture. And the young current affairs YouTuber Wyatt Sharp, who didn't really have an opinion on the bill but seemed to be enjoying his special day in Ottawa. Uh, on Bill C-11 in particular, I will say that it has obviously sparked a lot of debate and many opinions have been put forward as it relates to Bill C-11. The senators then asked me and the others a bunch of questions about our specific concerns with the legislation. Would it not also uh, concurrently at the same time broaden your reach across Canadian viewers? Will you want to have an opt-out clause from discoverability? I wonder do you believe it will be useful, important, have the policy director released now? And does the failure to release the policy directive contribute to uncertainty for you and your uh, colleagues? I won't play too much of this because, to be honest, a lot of it was pretty dry and technical in nature. But it really did seem like the senators had a genuine desire to listen to and learn from our perspectives. I think that when you uh, talk to YouTubers as I have, there's just a tremendous amount of uncertainty about the future. We don't really know what our future is going to look like. We don't know what kind of content we're going to have to make. We don't know how this is going to affect our revenue, how this is going to affect our discoverability, how this is going to affect our bottom line, and, you know, this is what we make a living doing. And so it is not helpful, I think, for government to have introduced a tremendous amount of uncertainty into the future of this very vibrant and dynamic and important part of the Canadian cultural economy at this critical time. I don't want to see a position where Canadian content creators have to choose between their own country and international stardom. I think that the status quo has allowed you to be successful in Canada and successful internationally. And I think that one of the problems with the kind of underlying mindset or motive of this bill is that it views those two objectives as being sort of at odds when I don't think there's any evidence that they are. I think it's entirely possible to be extraordinarily successful making Canadian content and still appealing to an international audience. And I, I would say that that's actually what I do. I make a ton of videos that are very particular in their Canadian focus, and yet my audience is still primarily international. Politicians pass laws that sort of set out broad guidelines, broad objectives, but then it's ultimately the, uh, the executive branch agency, such as the CRTC, that has to come up with the specifics. So it's true, like until we get guidance, until we get a, a directive from the CRTC of how they are going to use these powers, how they're going to interpret their mandate to improve discoverability, to, pr uh, to improve the promotion of Canadian content as, you know, determined by their assessment of what good Canadian content is, how they are going to interpret their mandate to promote, you know, the, the content of marginalized communities and so forth, until we have a clear sense of how that actually is going to be implemented and how YouTube and other platforms are actually going to be legally required to implement it. We are all just kind of still in the realm of speculation. If I can say something like, I think that we as Canadians have all had the experience of turning on the television and seeing some some Canadian show that we just don't want to watch. And we're like, why is this being shown? Nobody's watching this. This is clearly not popular. 
This is, and then you go to resent it, right? You resent sort of CanCon. Like CanCon in some corners of this country is like a dirty word or is a, you know, is a is an insult because it's associated with like CRTC mandates forcing content that people don't really want onto the airwaves, onto their televisions. And I think the last thing we want is for that same sort of culture of resentment towards Canadian content to emerge in the internet space. And I just think that Parliament has to assert itself a little bit more if it has anxieties about control over this sort of process. Things never got particularly heated or tense, when which helped ensure the conversation stayed relevant and on topic, but didn't exactly make for many entertaining moments. How do you feel like you did? Uh, I feel I did okay. I mean, I feel like it was much less heated than the uh, House Committee. You know, much less, uh, much less partisan, much less combative. But, you know, that's a good thing, right? Like, I feel like the Senators came off as they're supposed to come off in our system. You know, they're supposed to be sort of moderate, considerate, thoughtful people. And I think certainly compared to the House members, they they came off that way. I think that, you know, I, I have, I mean, I don't, I'm not naive. I don't think that they're going to do everything that I want. Even everything that I want is a matter of compromise. But I think it seems pretty clear to me that this group is probably going to put forward some good faith amendments to the legislation. And I'm curious to see those. I'm definitely prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt because I feel like they gave me the benefit of the doubt, and ultimately that's all you can ask for. So now we are really in the home stretch. The Senate will propose its amendments, the House will take or leave them, there will be a final vote in both chambers, and in all likelihood, some version of Bill C-11 will become law. Will any of my concerns be alleviated, or will Canadian YouTube users soon enter a grim new era of government control? Stay tuned. It's almost done.